A jogger murdered in New York's Central Park. A little girl gunned down in her family's car in Los Angeles. A judge has sentenced two boys for killing another child who refused to steal candy for them. There's a tidal wave of juvenile violent crime right over the horizon. And some who study it say the worst is yet to come. Life in the 1990s was dominated by a sense that youth violence was out of control. The future looked bleak. To explain why, one word said it all. Super predators. Some social scientists and criminologists looked at the data and saw doom. They stepped out of their ivory towers and into the public arena to sound the alarm about a coming wave of kids who were going to ravage the country. A super predator is a young juvenile criminal who is so impulsive, so remorseless, that he can kill, rape, maim without a, a, giving it a second thought. The prediction was terrifying, and lawmakers cracked down on juvenile offenders. This country went into a moral panic over super predators. But there was one problem. The calculations were wrong. They made it up. Along this stretch of grassy road, one night in early September 1994, when most grade schoolers were getting ready for a new school year, a grisly murder took place. In Chicago, the body of an 11-year-old gang member nicknamed Yummy is found beneath an underpass. Police say Robert was murdered by two members of his own gang, 16-year-old Craig Hardaway and his younger brother. Derek Hardaway was 14 when he and his brother drove to the underpass to kill Robert Sandifer, or Yummy. Sandifer himself had shot and killed a teenage girl before he was murdered. Derek waited in the car while Craig pulled the trigger. I remember the night when things took place. You got a page from a guy named Kenny. I'm not actually sure what he said to my brother, but it was to kill Robert. Derek and his brother belonged to Chicago's Black Disciples Gang. If I was told to do certain things, even if I didn't want to do it, it was either do what I'm being told or have it done to me. Even in an era of violent teen killers, Robert Sandifer's murder was big news. The story scared people, says criminologist Barry Crisberg. This was no longer a Chicago story. This was a story that no matter where you lived, you turned on the evening news and you would hear about this case. By now, nearly all of us know the story of Robert Sandifer. There was a sense that the country writ large was going to hell in a handbasket. No one had a clear idea of what to do. Political scientist John DiUlio taught at Princeton University and had done extensive research in prison studying the criminal justice system. From 1984 to 1994, when Sandifer was killed, teenage homicide rates had more than doubled. Diulio looked at studies that estimated that by 2000, there would be a million more teens between the ages of 14 and 17, and he predicted crime rates would snowball even more. You'd have a doubling or a tripling in the rate of youth violence in the, in the time between the mid-90s and up to through mid-2000s. Perhaps most troubling to Diulio was what he saw as an indication that the small percentage of kids who commit the most violent crimes would be much more destructive than the generation before them. Studies found that essentially 6% of every male youth cohort was responsible for about 50% of all the violent crimes committed by that cohort. That small fraction of people is going to be able to wreak incredible havoc. Diulio wasn't the only one predicting a surge in crime. By the year 2005, we may very well have a bloodbath of teenage violence. Northeastern University criminologist James Fox says his choice of words was deliberate. I did sound an alarm, and I did use some rather strong language in terms of what might happen if we didn't react quickly. Fox and Diulio felt compelled to call attention to this perceived problem, and rhetoric proved the most powerful arrow in their quiver. Diulio, an Ivy League academic from South Philadelphia, wrote this article for the Weekly Standard in 1995. The term super predator originated from an inmate who said, as almost a throwaway line, he said, oh, these kids, they're, they're stone cold predators. 
And like a match to a flame, the word caught on. Super predator. Predator. Predators. Super predator. Linguist Ben Zimmer studies language and culture. When you use a word like predator, it is loaded with certain assumptions about the way that an animal hunts another animal. And so to call someone a super predator really amps that up even more. We're talking about a group of kids who are growing up essentially fatherless, godless, and jobless. Diulio says that he wasn't pointing to any particular racial group as being the most potentially violent. But in 1996, he wrote that as many as half of these juvenile super predators could be young black males. Race was the central issue. That as the number of minority children, principally African American, but also Latino children, that to the extent that that number was increasing in the society, with them would come a big crime increase. What's required in moral panic is the identification of a particular group of people who are demonized in some way. When you describe another group as godless, uh, you can do anything to them. Lawmakers seize the moment to spur on the overhaul of a legal system they considered too lax. Kids that once stole hubcaps now rape and murder. No fear of punishment. Experts call them super predators. There are no violent offenses that are juvenile. You rape somebody, you're an adult. You shoot somebody, you're an adult. Virtually every state, almost 45 states, enacted laws cracking down on juvenile offenders, making it easier to prosecute youth in adult criminal courts, increase penalties. But at the same time the laws were being enacted, juvenile crime rates were already starting to show a surprising trend. Juvenile crime rates have been plummeting during this period of time in the wake of this panic. The drop in juvenile crime has been attributed to many things. A stronger economy, better policing, a decline in crack cocaine use. But Diulio's research had not foreseen any of these trends. We were at the, you know, on the precipice of being able to explain and predict all kinds of things, poverty trends, crime trends, and so forth. None of that work, none of those predictions in any of those fields have borne fruit. By the late 1990s, after a steady decline in juvenile crime, Diulio could see just how mistaken he was. The super predator was a no-show. The predictions were off by a factor of four. It had doubled and it was supposed to double again, and instead it was halved, <laughs> right? And so that's about as far off as one could possibly get. The super predator idea was wrong. Once it was out there, though, it was out there. There was no reeling it in. The experience was a turning point. Diulio increasingly began to think about religion and public affairs as the best way to affect change. I lost faith in social science prediction at about the same time that I gained faith of a traditional religious con. But Chrisberg says the problem wasn't with social science, but that Diulio not only misinterpreted the data, but what it meant. It was a myth. And unfortunately, it was a myth that some academics jumped onto. The fear over the super predator led to a tremendous number of laws and policies uh, that we're just now recovering from. In a public move, Diulio and Fox both signed a friend of the court document in a 2012 Supreme Court case that would ban mandatory life sentences for juveniles convicted of murder. I signed the amicus uh, brief. I thought that although the arguments were a bit one-sided, it came to the right conclusion. And so I signed it. It's because at the end of the day, it's what's going to matter most. What did you do and why did you do it? And did it make a positive difference? Diulio's side prevailed. Automatic mandatory life sentences, the justices said, amount to cruel and unusual punishment. Derek Hardaway was sentenced to 45 years for his role as an accomplice in the murder of Robert Sandifer. He will be up for parole in 2016. I got sentenced, being told you got to do more time in prison than you actually live at that time. That's harsh, especially for a 16-year-old to accept. John DiULio has worked with three White House administrations to try to implement faith-based initiatives in needy communities. 
but he says he's out of the business of forecasting. Demography is not fate, and criminology is not pure science. And that lesson, I think, uh, this, this episode from 20 years ago, and I think many, many other things in public policy, I mean, that we should carve that in stone, put it above every, every research institution and uh, every foundation.